Hey folks, thanks for checking out Missio Church in Manor, Iowa. You are listening to audio recorded at our Sunday morning service. If you'd like any more information on the gospel or would like to learn more about Missio Church, you can find us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash Missio Mount Air. Chapter 7, verse 1. But they would have a position. They'd be quick to know that Christians are not to judge. Very quick. Judge not. It is one of the most popular, well-known, most quoted verses in the Bible. Judge not. Not that they could give you the reference, but people, the common uh, American culture is going to know that there's a passage in our Bibles that says, judge not. Maybe they just say Christians aren't supposed to judge or they'll turn it into an adjective and they'll say, aren't you being kind of judgy? And that's a bad thing. You're not supposed to be judgy. We know that according to scripture, by your own confession as a Christian, you're not to be judgy. And when they say this, what they are basically meaning is that they think that Christians, the idea is that Christians shouldn't tell others what is right or wrong. If you have a statement of, this is a wrong behavior, this is a sinful behavior, this is a sinful attitude, and by the definition of the world, that is, that is what they're saying, is being judging. But is that what Jesus means? What does he mean when he says, judge not, lest you be judged? Before we answer that, though, I want you to think just for a second, that when those who claim that we shouldn't judge others, is that we shouldn't say any behavior is right or wrong. Um, it isn't even really what they mean when they say that. They, they, this, it's a self-defeating argument. Often when someone says this to me, it's because of a certain moral position that I might hold. Um, this actually has happened lately in my own life. I've faced a, this very accusation because of my affirmations of the biblical parameters of human sexuality, that uh, God has designed uh, man and woman to be together in the covenant of marriage, one man, one woman, for one life, and within that context is the safety for, for positive human sexuality. And so when having a discussion with someone who disagreed with me, they would say, well, it isn't your place to judge. So I would ask, well, what do you mean by that? Are you telling me that my position is wrong? <laughs> yes. Well, isn't that being a little judgy to tell me that my position is wrong? <laughs> and you're, by, by saying I shouldn't judge, you're guilty of the very thing that you're accusing me of. You're judging me by trying to tell me not to be judgy, to not be judging. It's a self-defeating argument. If by their definition... Judging is telling someone else that their behavior is wrong, then they themselves are guilty of judging by telling me that I shouldn't be judging other people. And so it's a self defeating argument. The very act of telling me I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing is them judging me by their own definition. By that standard, it doesn't really win much except to say that by that definition of judging, let's be honest, everyone's judging all the time in various and multitudes different ways. We are judging, we are saying right, we are saying wrong. We are practicing at some level discrimination. Like discrimination is such a dirty word in our world today and there is negative discrimination. But there also is just the reality that we all discriminate all the time and it's a, actually a good thing to discriminate between certain uh, people, certain uh, certain things. Like if you're gonna hire a babysitter for your kids, it's okay to be discriminating. Like you don't wanna necessarily hire someone who's got a criminal record and like has known to be abusive or something along those lines and then you have you know your, your aunt or whatever who loves kids and lo knows your kids and is great with them. It's okay at that point to discriminate and say, I'm gonna hire this person to care for my kids and not this other person. That's okay discrimination. Uh, many people, uh, Clint isn't here this morning so I can pick on him. Clint is a very discriminating person. And by that I mean he refuses to put the coffee maker and get it going because he doesn't like coffee. <laughs> that is a discrimination. 
but it's an okay discrimination, right? It's okay to not like coffee and to discriminate against coffee. <laughs> well, I mean, in theory, <laughs> in theory, it's okay. I don't think it's okay. But in theory, that's, a, that's an okay discrimination. It's okay when we all do it all the time. Some things are right, some things are wrong. And that's just the reality of what we do as human beings. But is that what Jesus means? Judge not that you be not judged. And the answer is no. It is not just that simple definition of not being able to decide what is right and what is wrong or to define and clarify and say something is right and something is wrong. Matthew 18 is probably the clearest indication we have of there is an obligation upon us as, as Christians, as brothers and sisters in the family of God, to point out when someone is in sin. Matthew 18 is this famous church discipline passage where if you see your brother in the wrong, you were to go to them and say, hey, there's this something off in your life. There's a sin issue here. And if they don't listen, then you take another brother or sister along with you to say, hey, there's a real, there's a real sin issue here. And this is Jesus' words saying that we actually are under an, a command from him to discern right from wrong and to say so. But you don't have to go even that far. In just a few weeks, you can look down and we'll be in um, chapter 7, verse 15 of Matthew, where Jesus tells us to beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. Jesus, right in this passage, and just a few verses later, is saying there are false prophets out there. There are people out there who are not speaking the truth, and it's okay to say that's not the truth. It's okay to say that that is not right, that is wrong, and is dangerous and ought to be dealt with and refuted. And so Jesus can't just mean we aren't to say certain things are right and certain things are wrong. Jesus, instead, what he is talking about is our position toward people, towards the individuals who are doing wrong. So if I were to put it in a, in a single big idea, this is the way that I would put it. The, the big idea from this section is this. The king's people are always gracious with the sinner and always grave or serious with sin. Are always gracious with the sinner, but are always grave with the sin. So the first, the first, big, first section of this big idea is that the king's people are to be gracious with the sinner. He says, judge not that you be not judged. Now, I don't mean that we just overlook sin as no big deal, but that we are always to be hesitant to rush to any final conclusion on any sinner. Always hesitant to rush to a final conclusion, to sit as their judge and to say, here's a sin in your life that I deem as too far or whatever. God, you are judged. It is over for you. There is no further reason to, to, for you to hear the gospel even. There, it seems that Jesus' concern here is that we would be, that to not be hastily pronouncing a final verdict on someone based on a momentary reality in their life. That is what judging someone is. That is what it means to sit as the judge, is to say uh, you're looking at a moment in their life and pronouncing a verdict, right? That's what a judge does. They sit in a courtroom, they go through the evidence, here's a moment in a person's life, all the details and the witnesses come in, and then they judge and they give a verdict. Here's the final say on this person. And Jesus is cautioning instead to not be, the king's people are not like that. It is a, we are not to look at a moment of a life and then just give a verdict. So when it comes to sinners, which this is an important thing to remember in our definition, when it comes to sinners, which we all are, <laughs> this isn't like when it comes to sinners, you know, those people out there, no, this is, a, this is an inter, inner discussion, inner, di, inner dialogue amongst us. When it comes to sinners, which are all of us, Jesus is warning us about looking at someone who may truly and seriously be caught in a moment of sin and then pronouncing a judgment on them. Well, now you've done it. Not, not only the things you've done are wrong, but you actually are beyond help. You are beyond, you are, you, it is, it is, you have gone too far, it is too much. Jesus is clearly done with you. And Jesus is warning against that 
sort of attitude. We don't get the say on someone's final judgment. Jesus gives a pretty stern warning that to live in such a way, he says, is to welcome that same judgment upon yourself. Saying that if the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And the measure you use, it will be measured to you. So, the king's people are to be gracious with the sinner. However, <laughs> the king's people are also to be very grave, which is not just, I'm, it's the to Jesus, the Baptist in me coming out, the alliteration, sorry, are to be grave or serious with sin. They are to be serious about sin. We ought to be gracious to those around us in the multitudes of conditions they are found in. It doesn't mean we don't take sin seriously. It's the second part of our big idea. It doesn't mean we aren't able to say when actions and attitudes in the lives of others are sinful, that they are contrary to God's will as revealed in Scripture. It doesn't mean we can't say when a specific teaching or position isn't contrary to Scripture. Not at all. But Jesus does give a prerequisite when doing so. He says that if we are going to call sin, sin, when we see it in others, be it out there, be it in the church, be it wherever it may be in our own household, if we are going to call sin, sin, when we see it, we must first check our own lives and deal with the sin that is revealed there. Giant hurdle in our church today is this dangerous indifference to sin. Dangerous indifference to sin. Where so many see that the biggest problem in the church is its judgmentalism, it's actually complacency, I think, in sin. But I don't mean our complacency with the sin out there in the world. <laughs> like we just become complacent with the sin out there in the world. That's an argument to be made. I think there also is a complacency with the sin within the church. And when our claim of being judgmental really stings is when it reveals our hypocrisy because we have shown that we really hate everyone else's sin but kind of love our own. For instance, the, the church's stance, and I say this meaning the mainstream American church, the, the church's stance against something like so-called um, same-sex marriage. That argument really was lost for much of the mainstream church when it stopped valuing marriage, <laughs> when it stopped really fighting for the, the longevity and the seriousness of and defending marriage altogether. When, when divorce became not a grievous and terrible reality to, to weep over and to fight against and to work hard and to, to want to see not happen, but when that stopped being like this grievous reality of a broken world, it does exist, but became like a, a reasonable and defendable pursuit, then the church really lost its footing when it came to defending uh, against uh, all sorts of different ideas of what marriage is. So we must care for this where Jesus goes on. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but don't notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there's a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye. And then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. We must care for the log, the large morally serious sins in our own eye, in our own lives, before we can look and help our brother or sister remove the speck the small sin, maybe even, that is in their lives. We must take sin seriously. Something that Jesus covered, right, in Matthew chapter 5, those incredible hyperbolic statements where he says, if your hand causes you to sin, what are you supposed to do? Cut it off. <laughs> and if your eye causes you to sin, you are to pluck out your eye. That there's, and he doesn't mean literally, but he's talking about, he's using hyperbolic statements that we might treat sin for the deadly reality that it is. If there's a plank in your eye, you must remove it before trying to take a dust speck out of someone else's eye. But then, once having then seriously dealt with the log in our eye, we do then have an obligation to point out the sin in the lives of our brothers or sisters. Early on in our work through the Sermon on the Mount, I Ask the question, if anyone gets to tell you no, 
Does anyone get to, get to say no to you on anything? Is there ever a desire that you have, something that you want to do, that anyone gets to say, no, you don't get to do this anymore. You don't get to go down that path. Well, if we swing back around to that idea, does anyone get to confront you on sinful behaviors or attitudes? Does anyone in your life get to say, I think this is actually a sin issue that you need to like, seriously deal with? Like, it isn't just a, a funk or a bad moment. Like, there's, there's a sinful attitude. There's a sinful action. There's something in your life. There's a plank in your eye, a log that you really need to deal with. You really need to remove it. We, while we are to be gracious with, um, with sinners, we are to take and to be very grave with sin. And yes, even our own. It is so easy to write down a record of all the sins we take seriously when we look out there. But the first list we ought to write are all the sins that we are concerned about that live right in here. <laughs> That's the first concern of the Christian. What is the sin in what is the plank in my own life? What are the sins in my own heart that that keep me from keep me at, at, at odds with with my savior that I need to deal with those first before and then as I have dealt with those then I am able to see clearly and help my brother or sister with their speck in their own eye to fail to do so is to attempt to put out sin and others uh, to remove their specks with this giant tube I mean, the illustration communicates all that you really need to know it's like trying to help you with a speck. Well, I've got a two by four, and as I turn around and, and hit you, with, I'm, I'm basically killing you with this plank coming out of my eye. I can't even get close enough to you really to help you. It's a pretty clear illustration. Why, why, does, that, why does refusing to deal with our own sin before we deal with our brother or sister's sin damaging? Well, first is because you can't see clearly. When you've got your own sinfulness, when you're... When you are mired and stuck in your own selfish, sinful pursuits, it clouds your vision. You don't see things clearly. You look at the world and you see certain desires, certain impulses, certain uh, wishes, and your own sinfulness, it clouds your vision such that you look at other people and you don't see them clearly because you're so busy with thinking about your own sin. Your own sinfulness will warp and bend your perspective. You also... Um, if, if you don't deal with the log in your eye before dealing with the sin of another, you might just help trade them one sin for another. And so because you haven't dealt with your own stuff, you go and you say, hey, this is wrong in your life, and you might actually end up feeding them a different sin, maybe your preferred sin, as your preferred idolatry or whatever, to help them out. But thirdly, the reason why it's so important to deal with the plank in your own eye before you deal with the speck in your brother's eye is because to fail to do so will lead you to judging and you will not deal with your brother or sister compassionately. When you deal with a plank in your own eye, it changes your attitude towards your fellow sinner, your fellow struggler, your fellow person who is pursuing God. You're able to come to them not from the position on high, like if I were standing up here, that's why I don't like to stand up here anymore, because it, it communicates some idea that, hey, we're, I'm up here and you're all down there. And the reality is when it, it comes to the family of God, we're all down here together, pursuing our Savior together. There isn't like, I'm the high and holy one that you need to come up to my place, become like me that we might pursue God. It's like, look, we all, when we deal with a plank in our own eye, it enables us to then go to our neighbor and say, I know what it's like to desire X, Y, and Z. I know what it's like to have this be the thing that I long for, this be my wish, this be my hopes. I know what it's like to be stuck down in there. And I'm here to say to you and to come make an appeal to say, come with me as we both turn from that and pursue our Savior together. There, there is a compassion that comes in when you first deal with the sin that is in your own life. Why are we able to do this? To think about the, the, the gravity, the seriousness with which we talk about and confront the sin in our own lives. How and why are we able to do that? Wouldn't it be easier to just kind of sweep them aside and say, yeah, I know I've got lots of wrong thinking. Yeah, I know I've got lots of things messed up. But let's just kind of sweep them under the rug and move on. Wouldn't that be far more beneficial? 
Why is it important and why can we even say no? Our, our job is not to bury those things, but to bring them out into the light, to deal with them head on. Why are we able to do this? Because of the continued struggle with your sin, it is not the full extent of your story. It is not the final say in your story. Your sin does not get, if you are Christ, if you are God's through Christ, your sin does not get the final say in your story. Not in the life of a believer. We are able to deal with the major sins of our lives and the sins of others because we have a remedy to the reality of sin. We have a hope that combats the reality of sin. We have a promise that combats against the penalty of our sin. We have a Savior. And so we're able to pull those realities. We're able to pull out and, and put to light our divided hearts because we have a Savior. We have a rescuer. We have a rescuer. Jesus, the one who was truly sinless, he had no plank in his eye, not even a speck in his eye. What does this one who is perfect and sinless do? He takes the sin of his people upon himself. He takes the wrath that his people deserve because of their sin upon himself on the cross so that every one of us in this room this morning realizing, yeah, I got some planks. I've got some, I got some areas where I have turned my back on my sovereign king and lived for myself instead of him. That is the essence of sin, rebellion against God. There are some things I need to turn from. I have worshipped myself. I have worshipped the things of this world. I have loved the created things and not the creator. And there are things I need to repent of. Jesus Christ has come so that every one of us, admitting those things, confessing, yes, I need to repent, and looking to him and his righteous life, his sacrificial death on the cross, his resurrection, his defeat of death itself, everyone in this room this morning, looking to Christ like this, can be forgiven of your sin. Reconciled to God. Brought into his family. Eternally secured to him through faith in Jesus Christ. Forgiven and made righteous in his sight. So therefore, as the king's people, we are able to be gracious with those who are sinning, which includes ourselves. And also grave and serious about sin because we are not left without a hope. We are not left without a remedy. We're not left without an answer to it. It is Jesus Christ, the righteous one, that as we face these things, as we admit the wickedness that we find in our own hearts and we bring it to light, we have someone who died to save us from the penalty of these sins. There's almost a side of me that grows concerned for a Christian when they have a strong reaction to facing the reality that they might have indwelling sin they need to deal with. You find this with people. You know, they claim to be Christian and, and, and then you might see a sin issue in their life and mention, well, do you think this is right or wrong? And there's, there's a knee-jerk reaction. What are you, t you know, there's like, no, what are you, what are you talking about? The, the, the person who has been humbled before God realizes their deep need of their Savior, they are not surprised by the residual sin they need to turn from. <laughs> when someone comes to them and says, here's an issue, here's a, you know, have you thought about this, the way that you're handling this? Have you thought about this teaching? Have you thought about various issues of your life? The Christian normally would, you know, might first have a knee-jerk reaction of kind of like, hey, don't tell me what to do. That's understandable. But at some level, it's no surprise. There's all kinds of specks. There's all kinds of planks even. That, that, that reside in us, in our, in our old man, that need to be confessed and brought out, brought into the light, that the gospel might do its work. I went to lunch with an unbelieving friend a few years ago, and our discussion turned into this topic, and I was talking about, I was just having, a, having an honest moment, talking about the residual sin in my life, and, you know, idolatries that I still try to deal with, and, and trying to turn my focus upon him, and, and, and he was confused that... Um, he thought I was being pretty hard on myself. He's like, boy, you just really, you just see sin everywhere you look in your life. And I'm kind of like, 
well, yeah, I actually kind of do. Uh, and he said, well, you're being kind of hard on yourself. How do you have any self-esteem, basically? And I could have answered back, well, you seem to be kind of uh, oblivious to yourself and don't realize how full of sin you really are. I didn't go that route. I said that the, the answer, the, the, the remedy to that is that why, why being able to face all of this and see how depravity does run in every element of our life and, and needs to be repented of and turned to Christ and looked to Him for a Savior, my response was that while a frank diagnosis of my sinfulness didn't immediately prop up self-esteem, it absolutely heightened my joy because there is a Savior that Jesus, in all of my wickedness, in all of my despair, in all of my shortcomings, in all of my failings, and all the times that I've turned from Him and walked my own way, my Savior has been there. My Savior took the penalty that I deserved upon Himself that I might be washed white as snow, delivered, made a part of His family, loved. <laughs> and so I'm able to face these things and not go into a, a dark corner of despair, but realize my God loves me. In the midst of this, He died to save me and pull me out of it by his grace and mercy. It gave me, it gives me greater joy in all that Jesus is for a sinner like me. So while the king's people ought to be gracious with sinners, we absolutely must be grave and serious with sin and all of its outworking in our own lives and in the lives that we love. But this last sentence, do not give to the dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before pigs. Honestly, commentators are kind of all over the map on this one. It's a, it's, I mean, the illustration is obvious, you know, don't take what is holy and righteous and wonderful and give it to dogs. Why? Because dogs eat everything. They don't care. They don't care what it is. My dog, I put out an underground fence and I put those little flags in. My dog ate one of the flags. And then it's like taking them and going to a big fancy restaurant and cooking, a, you know, a very expensive meal and then feeding it to your dog. They don't care. You ever see them, you know, you have this nice meal and you drop it and they, they didn't even enjoy it. They just swallow it. It's gone. And so the illustration works. Like don't take something that's very precious and then throw it before a dog. Don't take a pearl, a beautiful piece of jewelry and try to give it to a pig because they just wallow it in the mud and it's just gone. They trample it underfoot. Don't take what is precious and just throw it away. But if we tie it to the section that we're working through, I think a reasonable application is that we ought to be careful about applying a gospel remedy to those who see no need for the gospel. If the hard work hasn't been done of realizing how greatly I need a Savior, then, then applying the gospel is like, a, it's like throwing a, it's, it's, it's a waste of a treasure at some level. The hard work in our own hearts when we rush, it's kind of what Jim was saying there about there's the bad news to the good news. If we rush through the bad news to get to the good news, it's like the good news doesn't have its full effect. It's like a dog eating a gourmet meal. But when we've done the work to like realize the morning, to have the mourning over our sin, brokenness over our rebellion, then, then it is the enjoyment of a gourmet meal, of the gospel good news of what Jesus has done. So, we must, as the king's people, be gracious with sinners. Your story is not over. And no matter where you find yourself in this walk of life, no matter what sins have happened in your past, and honestly, no matter what sins lie in your future, and we all have sins that lie in our future, they do not write the final line of your story. For every one of us, turning from our sins, looking to Jesus, working by the power of His Spirit to stop those sins, His salvation has come. Everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. There is good news. So while, as the King's people, we must be gracious with sinners. The call is there to turn, to trust Him. We do not know the details that have led to so many people to the place that they are in. We cannot write anyone off as beyond the help of Jesus. And also, we must be gravely serious with the reality of the deadliness of sin. And the gospel then comes in and shines in and shows itself to be the good news that it truly is. Let's pray. Father, this morning... <laughs> We want to rightly diagnose the plank in our own eye because it is when we descend into that, that valley the Puritans talk about the, 
the, the valley of vision, that it is in the, the deep well, the valley of the darkness, the valley of the shadow of death even, that then the brightest lights become so visible. And so, Father, this morning as we've gathered into this place, I pray that you would open our eyes to the things we need to turn from, the planks that maybe exist in our own eyes, not for the, the beating up of your people, but that full rejoicing in the gospel might abound because we have a Savior who loved us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. What good news that is. In this is love, not that we have loved him, but that he loved us and gave himself as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. May that good news well up in every heart as we seek to take the planks out of our eyes, that we might help our brothers and sisters turn from their sin and enjoy and rejoice in Jesus the all-sufficient Savior. Pray these things in His name. Amen.